in the first section, we looked at the atmosphere. We also looked at um, CO2 and how it got into the atmosphere and its correlation with temperature. Now we're going to focus more specifically on climate change. As we saw in the last, one, uh, last section, global surface temperatures are increasing with increased CO2. So here is a graph of temperature variation. The red is a direct measurement. The blue is proxy measurements. And temperature is going up. It just is at this point. At this point, going up was the Industrial Revolution. And that has led to the largest temperatures ever determined or ever, I, I don't want to say recorded because using proxy data it's not really a recording, but hopefully you get the idea here. Right. The Industrial Revolution is when we started really burning coal and burning natural gas and, and it was the start of our reliance on fossil fuels. Here are some smokestacks. Aren't they lovely? The predicted mean global temperature change by the year 2100, so at the start of next, uh, next century, is one half to four and a half degrees increased from the zero point. That's off the chart can't even put it on here. So we've talked about this a little bit, but what evidence do we have for climate change? We have all the atmospheric data from either direct measurements or proxy measurements from ice cores. Those show that the average surface temperature increased over the 20th century by about uh, half a, or 0.6 degrees C or 1 degree Fahrenheit. The 17 hottest years on record have occurred since 1980. We also can see that we have wide-scale recession of glaciers. Since the 1960s, we've had 10% decrease in ice cover. We're also observing a rise in sea level. During the 20th century, it rose 10 to 20 centimeters, which is 4 to 8 inches. We've also seen an increase in the ocean temperature since the late 1950s. And remember, the oceans are the things that regulate the temperature of the planet because they're these huge bodies of water that store a vast amount of energy. The Earth is a greenhouse. We discussed this a little bit in the last section. Um, when gases are trapped in the troposphere, um, let me repeat that. When gases in the troposphere trap infrared heat, like the windows in your car or the roof of an actual greenhouse, surface temperature rises. Right. So the fact that these arrows right here in this schematic were reflected back down to the earth, that is the greenhouse effect. Ordinarily, those would go up and re-radiate to space, but they're not. So what are the greenhouse gases? Carbon dioxide is a big one. The big source of it is burning fossil fuel, um, but also the fact that we have vegetation loss, because remember, we can trap CO2 in vegetation. Um, right now, the CO2 level is 35% higher than it was before the Industrial Revolution. We're adding 6.6 .6 billion metric tons annually and we do have sinks still. Oceans and forests are um, capable of storing CO2 for us. Other greenhouse gases. Water vapor is a greenhouse gas, and it comes about through the hydrologic cycle. Methane, which comes about from animal husbandry and rice paddies. Nitrous oxide is a chemical fertilizer, and CFCs and other halocarbons are good refrigerants. All of these are greenhouse gases, which is why we are no longer allowed um, freon 
in our air conditioners. What are the impacts of global warming? Well, melting of polar ice caps, flooding of coastal areas, massive migrations of people inland, uh, more intense and frequent storms. Sea temperature and wind speed moisture content are correlated. Remember, the oceans regulate the climate. If they go up, then it's not surprising that other things are going to change as well. Here is a picture of Mount Kilimanjaro in Tanzania. Look at the snow cap in 2000 compared to 2006, how much it has decreased. Other images, here is a, I believe that's a walrus in the Arctic. Oh, it does say walrus at the top. According to NASA, the Arctic sea ice, sea ice has been decreasing at 9% per decade. So if you look at it in 1979 versus 2003, surface warning trends in the Arctic are eight times greater than trends over the past 100 years. The season for sea ice melt, so the number of days that the sea ice actually melts, has increased by 10 to 17 days per decade. As ice mass decreases, more light is absorbed than reflected, and this is yet more problem because we're absorbing the light that means the energy is again trapped and not reflected out of the atmosphere so this increases warming here we have a picture of uh, children in Dhaka blank Bangladesh see how their house or their neighborhood is flooded Here is a picture of the projected sea rise uh, in Florida for 100 years from now. Anything shown in red will be underwater. There's this lovely island. I like it. Impacts of global warming. Alteration of rainfall patterns. We have more precipitation globally due to evaporation from oceans and soil. We have deserts becoming farmland and farmland becoming deserts. Think about California, the huge drought that is going on there. And then you have other areas of the country that are getting excessive amount of rain. Because of this, we have significant losses in crop yields. So now the question is, how warm will we get? Surface dep temperatures depend on the net outcome of several factors leading to warming or cooling. The greenhouse gases, greenhouse gases the GHGs, they cause warming. Volcanic activity causes cooling. Aerosols like sulfate also cool and ice and snow cool. So which will win? Climate and sea level changes depend on anthropogenic behaviors. Remember, anthropogenic means caused by humans. So these graphs show a variety of different scenarios based on um, different factors. So anything with an A is rapid growth, peaking at um, population mid-century and global convergence. If you have uh, balanced energy, that's AIB, A1B. Non-fossil energy is A1T. AIF1, not, maybe that's an L. I think that's an L, actually. Is fossil intensive energy sources. 
A2 is continuous growth with regional independence. B1 is rapid growth with a peak population mid-century but using efficient technologies. And P2 is continuous growth with sustainable development. So if we look at, say, the CO2 emission graph, where will we be in the year 2100? Well, if we follow the dotted red line here, that is A1FL, which is the fossil intensive, we end up with the most CO2. The green line is B1. So using efficient technologies, that is a lower CO2. And those trends appear to hold pretty much through each um, graph. So the first graph was CO2 emissions. The second one is CO2 concentration. So again, A1FL results in the most concentrated CO2, and green is the uh, B1. For sulfur dioxide, another uh, greenhouse gas, it's a little bit different. The sulfur dioxide peaks with the solid black line, which I think is something called 1592A, which we don't have a description of. Regardless, reduced CO2 emissions must occur. We have to look at alternative energy sources. We have to look at reducing our fossil fuel, fossil fuel use, and we have to plant more green. We need more trees. So how can we do this? Well, we've discussed it a little bit. Here are little cars that are, um, I believe, electric from our previous discussion. Here is, I believe this is actually Dr. Vila planting trees. Right. How are scientists tracking warming? There is a YouTube link here. I'll try to remember to include it at the end of the unit for you to watch. Right. Other things that are happening. In 1997, the Kyoto Protocol was agreed upon. 38 countries met to create binding agreement to reduce greenhouse gas emissions.